Take your Bibles, would you please? And find the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew. I'll give you a moment to get there if you can, or use your app if you got an app, or Bible if you got a Bible. Matthew chapter 11. I am so glad to be in Michigan. How many of y'all are in Michigan? Is that everybody? I hope so. How many of you are here this morning? Let me see your hand if you're in the building. All right, everybody here? If you're not here, get here, because this is a little weird. But I am Dave Young, and I am so glad to be with you guys, and I've been praying about this day. I'm so thrilled to be here. I got this cool pullover out of this. Don't I look good? I'm telling you, I'm already cool. I got a cool pullover. I get to hang around some cool friends today, and I get to preach to some cool teenagers. Is cool a good word for teenagers? My kids tell me all the time that I need to get with the program. I'm using the wrong words. I have teenagers in my life. So I don't know, are you guys lit? Are y'all legit? Are y'all sick? Uh, I never know what's cool anymore. Y'all de bomb? Uh, whatever you are, I mean it, all right? So God bless you for being here today. I bring you greetings from my best friend, my favorite person, my my wife, my sweetheart, I'm sorry she can't be with me today. Bethany and I have been married 26 and a half years, and we are happily married. And I'm so, so sorry she can't be here. We have five youngins. I'm Dave Young, so my kids are the youngins. That's pretty cool, huh? That's legit. That's lit. That's just sick. I'm just telling you, all right? So uh, I have five kids. The youngins, Abigail is married and lives in California. My son Joshua is married. He lives in California. My son Matthew is in college in California. They need revival people, all right? And uh, then I have Jacob, who is 11th grader, and Charity Noel in the sixth grade. And uh, we've been on the road for weeks now. Haven't been home in about five weeks. And I flew in here last night. I fly out of here tonight. I start a revival in the morning in Carthage, North Carolina. And I'll preach there three or four or five times this week. Then I've got a revival at the end of the week in Cary, North Carolina. Then I'm driving to Florida for three days, to Knoxville for five days, back to Florida. And then I'm coming back to Michigan. And would y'all pray for something for me? Pray that it'll warm up. I am a Floridian. The warmer, the better. Can I get an amen here? Uh, y'all like snow up here because you're not right with God. I'm just telling you. And uh, I, I can't prove this, can't prove this, but I think cold weather is a result of the fall of man. I can't prove that, but I'm pretty close, I think. Now, my wife likes it cold. She grew up in the north, and uh, she's a cold weather person. I'm not, I'm not, I'm biblical. I like it warm, and I think I can make a case for it. How many of y'all know the story of the Garden of Eden? Do y'all know the story of the Garden of Eden? How many y'all know the story of the Garden of Eden? Now, just be careful here. Be wise about this. Did you know it was warm in the Garden of Eden? They didn't have on clothes, okay? Had to be warm. What happened as soon as sin entered the world? God had to clothe them with furs. My theory is it got cold. Cold is a result of the fall of man. Somebody says, yes, but snow is beautiful, but even snow in the Bible is connected to sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. So y'all pray for warm weather, all right? Because I'm coming back in a few weeks, and I want it warm. But to thank you for being here. Thank you for letting me preach to you, and I'm really thrilled and honored. I get to speak to you twice today, and uh, I'm preaching two messages, and I'm nervous as I'll get out because they're new sermons. And I'm an evangelist, people, and you pastors in the room, God bless you. I don't preach new sermons. I'm an evangelist. I preach sermons over and over and over and over again. Uh, pastors, my, my, I'm just impressed, all right? God bless you. But I'm doing two new sermons a day, young people, and uh, two commands of Jesus. I'm going to talk to you in this hour on come unto me, Jesus' command, come unto me. And I will talk to you in our final session today on Jesus' command to follow me. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 to the end of the chapter. And we'll begin reading in verse 28. If you have it, say amen. amen. Matthew 11, verse 28. Listen to the words of Jesus here. And Jesus says, very simply, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. These are awesome words. 
Amazing words. Will you listen? Let me read them again. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. What's the uh, most fearful command you've ever been given? Chances are you've never heard the command, hey, this is the police, come out with your hands up. And if you have, I'm giving an invitation in a few moments and I expect you to come. Some of you are driving. How many of you are driving? Raise your hand if you're driving. How many of you are excited about driving? How many of you know that we're not excited about you driving? We've seen you walk. We can't imagine you driving. <laughs> One of the most fearful things that will ever happen is when you're driving and you see blue lights in the rearview mirror and the command is to pull over. Anybody had that happen to you? Anybody here? Yes, a lot of you. Uh, what for? I come to Michigan all the time. Everybody in Michigan speeds. I'm convinced the theory in Michigan is all these potholes are better if you hit them at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> That's the theory of Michiganders, I'm convinced. I may be wrong, but I think I'm right about that. Uh, what's the most fearful commands you've ever been given? How many of you, when your mom and dad are really, 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 really upset at you, they use your full name? Your parents do that? My middle name is Hugo. Isn't that a great name? My parents had a sense of humor, okay? So my full name is David Hugo Young. And when I heard that phrase, when I would hear my mom say, David Hugo Young, I knew to run, <laughs> to pray, to seek God. You, you've heard that, haven't you? Your full name? I'm at that age of my life where I have five kids and I can never remember which kid I'm calling. How many of your parents do that to you? I call my kids. I, I can go through every name before I get the right one. And now the, fat, the sad fact is I'm even using the dog's name. And I'm like, for crying out loud, my son said to me, for crying out loud, Dad, that's the dog. All right, I'll get it right eventually. I'm, I'm 50 now. I have a reason for this. My son offended me the other day. You know what my son said to me? We were taking photos the other day. My son was helping us get lined up for the photos. My son leaned over and patted me right here and said, Dad, suck in that one pack. <laughs> I was highly offended. It's a two pack, okay? It's a two pack. It's turning into a two liter, but it's not a one pack yet. Now here's the deal. What's the most fearful command you've ever been given? Did your parents ever say to you, come here right now? You've heard that, haven't you? I love this command of Jesus. There are two commands I've been meditating on from the words of Jesus himself. The first one's right here, come to me. We'll look at the second one this afternoon. This passage, Jesus invites every teen in this room, every adult in this room, every man, every woman, every young man, every young lady, God invites all of us, Jesus invites all of us in this room to come to him, to learn of him, to receive rest from him. So I want to submit to you this morning that this is a command worth your evaluation. In the words of our Savior Jesus Christ, come unto me. It's worth your consideration. Four words I want to give you to evaluate these three verses. Invitation, frustration, limitation, declaration. All right, memorize them with me. The first word is invitation. What is it? First word is invitation. Second word is frustration. Invitation, frustration. Say both invitation, frustration. The third word is limitation. Invitation, frustration, limitation. You ready, everybody? Invitation, frustration, limitation. And the final word is declaration. What's the final word? One more time a little louder. What's the final word? Let's start with the invitation. Jesus says, come unto me. This is a way to God, this is a way to live. Now I don't know any of you much this afternoon. Some of you I know better than others. But I do want to stop here for a moment and tell you that when Jesus says, come unto me, what Jesus is saying is, this is, this is the way you can get to God. Nobody, nobody goes to heaven apart from coming to Jesus. Nobody can be right with God until you have made your way to Jesus. How many of y'all know this verse? Jesus said, I am the way, help me if you know it, I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. In other words, son, if you want to know God, you've got to go to Jesus. If you want to know what God is like, you've got to examine Jesus. If you want to know how to be right with God, you've got to be right with Jesus. Jesus says, come unto me. This is the way to God. Do you all know this verse? Jesus said, I am the door. How many of y'all know that verse? you know that one? I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved. I got saved when I was the age of some of you. I was 15 years old. And I was in a public high school. How many public high schoolers in the building? How many, how many of you? I was in a public high school. I went to church. I knew about God. I, I knew about the Bible. I, I celebrated Christmas. I celebrated Easter. But I get, did not come to know Christ until I, was, until I was 15. And God put a man in my life who more than just told me about the facts, he shared with me about the love. That there is a God in the universe, and He is out there, but He's not just out there somewhere. He's a God who came here and went to a cross and died for my sins so that through Him I could be forgiven. And He was buried and was raised from the dead so that through Him I could have everlasting life. And I don't know you ladies and gentlemen very well this morning, but I do want to ask you, do you know for sure that you've been to Jesus Christ and that your sins have been forgiven and that you have eternal life? I got saved on a Sunday night. The Bible uses the word saved. How many of y'all know that word? Do you know that word? Saved means to be rescued. Here, here's what the Bible teaches. You and I are sinners. We've all broken God's law. Sin is anything I think or say or do that's displeasing to God or that's against the word of God. And all of us are sinners. Every single one of us. Some are, perhaps we might say, humanly speaking, worse sinners than others. I suppose that's true. Though we're all sinners, some might be worse than others. Some people have a hard time. No, sin is sin. Somebody says, I know that, but I'd much rather be lied to than murdered, wouldn't you? Come on, wouldn't you rather be lied to than murdered? Talk to me, wouldn't you? So there are differences in sin. I get that, but everybody here is a sinner. And here's what the Bible teaches. If I'm going to get to know God, if I'm going to be on my way to heaven, if I'm going to have God in my life, if I'm going to be forgiven of my sins, if I'm going to have everlasting life, God has to do something in my life that rescues me from my sins that rescues me from the judgment of God, that rescues me from an eternity in hell. And here's the way God does that, through His Son, Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and was raised from the dead. When Jesus says in this passage, come unto me, when Jesus says, son, come to me, sir, ma'am, come unto me, what He's reminding you here is this is the way to God. All of us are sinners. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. All of us are in trouble with an almighty God. And the fact of the matter is, unless you come to Jesus Christ, you cannot be forgiven and you cannot have eternal life. So Jesus invites you to come. That's a way to God. But I will also tell you this is a way to live. Come unto me is a way to live. Students, so every one of you, young people, every one of you are deciding right now what you're going to do with your life. How many of you love being alive? Is that everybody? It's a wonderful thing to be alive, isn't it? Life, life is good. I saw, I saw a store the other day at a, uh, at a mall, and it was the life is good store. Well, that's, that's positive thinking, I suppose, but there are young people in this room, and the fact of the matter is life's not that good. If you're an average group of young people, a lot of you kids are burdened by life. There's bullying. Some of you have angry parents. Some of you are 15 years old and you're already battling an addiction to pornography. Life's not that good for the average teen in our generation. It's hard. Families are falling apart. Those that aren't divorced are busy. Many of you teens know that a busy home sometimes isn't much different than a divorced home. Life's hard. And the words of Jesus are very meaningful in our generation. Come unto me. All you that are labor and are heavy laden, come on. I got a better way. This world is messed up. This world is destroyed. This world is broken. This world is filled with bitterness. But come on, come on. I, I got a better way. Come unto me, all you that are labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Jesus is inviting us to be saved. Jesus invi is inviting us to a better way to live. So the first word is invitation. What's the first word? The second word. Second word is frustration. How many of you are aware that there are a lot of frustrations in life? How many of you are aware of that? Can you say algebra? 
How many of y'all agree that algebra can be frustrating? How many of y'all, just out of curiosity, how many of y'all hate algebra? Raise your hand good and high. How many of y'all love it? Any? Look at that. There's some weird people in the room. And uh, we love weird people. I love algebra too, so I'm on your side, weird people. Uh, I don't know what it is. I've just always loved algebra. I think it is just so cool to have letters in, alpha, in, in, in numbers com, you know, com, mixed together. I just think it's awesome. I love geometry. How many geometry lovers are in the room? How many of y'all think we are weird who love geometry? How many of y'all like that? There's a lot of frustrations in life, isn't there? Wish, I, I wish to God that all the frustrations of life were algebra, geometry, the thing about algebra and geometry is they end. No matter, no matter how long the year seems, you'll eventually walk out of the algebra class and you'll put your hands in the air and say, thank you, Jesus, I am done. Won't you? No matter how difficult geometry is for you and you just don't understand it, I mean, it makes no sense to you. If you can't see geometry, hang in there because I'm telling you, it's coming in and it's going to be done. But the frustrations of life, the frustrations of life don't end. Bullying is a massive issue, isn't it? Addictions are real, aren't they? You may be the first generation. Your generation may be the first generation, maybe the generation just above you, but certainly yours. You may be the first generation that's already battling major addictions in your teen years. These are awesome. I love these. Aren't they awesome? See, your generation has never known not having one. I grew up without one of these. I survived, but these are cool. For one thing, they got maps on them. I don't know how I got to churches before I had one of these. I just pull my phone and say, take me to First Baptist Church, Bridgeport, Michigan, and my phone says, turn left. My phone, when I first got it, was a lady's voice. How many of y'all know the lady's voice on, on, yeah, I had the lady's voice. And my wife said to me one day, honey, I don't like that lady talking to you. <laughs> she said, I am your lady. I said, fair enough. So now it is a Australian man's voice. <laughs> so I changed it. I have a guy talking to me, not a lady, because that is reserved for me lady, Bethley. Okay. So I had to change it. My, my, my Australian says, turn left, mate. And I turn left, mate. And he says, turn right. And I turn right. These are amazing. I love it that I can FaceTime. FaceTime is so awesome. I can see you while I'm talking to you. That is so cool. It is so cool. I love this technology. It's awesome. I love it. I love Marco Polo. Anybody here? Marco Polo. I love Marco Polo. My mother-in-law recently discovered Marco Polo and she's in her 70s and she is not technologically advanced. She's a little technologically challenged. I mean, you don't know what I mean by that. So she discovered Marco Polo and she was trying to figure it out while she was recording herself. So she was like, I don't know how to get this thing to stop. What in the world? And she's talking to herself and, we, and she had us all on a group message and we were howling with laughter and showing perfect strangers. Watch my mother-in-law. She did it for like 20 minutes. It was awesome. I love technology. But because of this, there are 15-year-olds in this room already battling the frustration of addiction. 467 million pages on the Internet in the United States alone, 467 million are dedicated to raw pornography. Your generation can go online and see more filth in one night than previous generations could see in a lifetime. This is a frustrated world. Bullying, addictions, anger. How, how many of you know teenagers that are angry? You do, don't you? How, how many of you know adults that are angry? This is a frustrating world. Brokenness. There are teens in this room and your life is full of brokenness. Somebody disappointed you. Somebody hurt you. 
a death of someone you cared about, a betrayal. Frustrations are normal to life. Jesus is addressing that in Matthew 11 here. No rest, no peace, no answers. How many of y'all know who Rhett and Link are? Is that their names? Am I getting that right? YouTube sensations. My boys laugh all the time at them. And they dedicate three hours recently of their program to tell you why they are against Christianity now. No answers. No answers. They, they have all the reasons why they're leaving, but they can't give you answers for where they're going. Frustrations. Jesus is addressing an invitation here, but he's addressing life's frustrations. You know what Jesus is doing here? He's reminding us of the destructive power of sin. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. How many of you teens are aware that sin is filled with destructive power? Are you aware of that? Sin promises happiness, but can only deliver harm. Sin promises joy, but can only deliver sorrow. Sin promises peace, but can only deliver turmoil. Sin promises fun, but can only deliver failure. Sin promises freedom, but can only deliver bondage. Jesus is addressing that in this text. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. The sorrows, the frustrations, the brokennesses, the bitterness, the difficulties, the challenges. Jesus is inviting you to come to him with all of your baggage, with all of your issues, with all of your problems. And the point is, he cares about you. He does care about you. How many of y'all knew that? Did you know that? Smile at the person beside you. And say to the person beside you, don't get carried away, just one phrase. Say this one phrase and then look right back at me. Turn to the person beside you and say to them, it's true that God loves you. <laughs> tell them one more thing, only one more thing, and then look right, only one, tell them one more thing, but then look right back at me. Smile at the person beside you and say to them, did you know he likes you too? <laughs> See, because here's what a lot of you think. I know there's a God out there. I know God's out there somewhere, and I know He cares, and I know all about God's love and all of that. But I want you to know it's true. He does love you, and He does care about you. And has it ever dawned on you, son, that Jesus likes you? G girls, He likes you. He knows all about you. It's true He loves you, but I want you to realize it's more personal than that. Come unto me, all of you. Make that personal. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You know what he's trying to say right there? I care about you, I love you, and in fact, I like you. How many of y'all, there are things about yourself you don't like? Come on, nobody here but us. How many of y'all wish your hair was different? Come on, how many of y'all wish your hair was different? How many of y'all wish your skin was a little different? How many of y'all wish your eyes were different? How many of y'all wish you had a one-pack like me? <laughs> See, there's all kinds of things we don't like about ourselves. But how many of you are aware of the fact that God doesn't judge you based on the color of your hair and the color of your skin and your eyes or, or your weight or whatever the issue may be? All of us have issues. All of us have issues. Go ahead. You didn't get that. Smile at the person beside you and say to them, bro, you got issues. Sis, you got issues. And how many of you say, no kidding? Look, God knows all about you and he cares. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What's he doing here? He's not only giving us an invitation, he's talking to us about our frustrations. All the heaviness and all the burdens and all the problems of your life. Jesus is addressing those right here. He knows about them. Sir, son, ma'am, kids, can I just tell you something? He knows about your home situation. And he cares. He knows about the anger of your daddy or mommy, and he cares. He's aware of the bullying that some of you have endured, and he cares. He knows your never-ending frustrating battle with this junk. He, he cares. The invitation is very personal. What's the issue of your life? What's going on in your home? What's the secret that you're carrying? Where's the pain of your heart coming from? What's the brokenness of your life? He cares. He's talking about invitation, 
frustration. Notice the third thing he talks about here, and that's the limitation. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 says, take my yoke upon you. This word yoke has two sides to it. The first side is there's a limitation. A yoke limits you. A yoke says, hold on, hold on, hold on. You got a yoke up with me. What's your name, son? Alex? Alex, come here, Alex. Well, for a moment you said Alice, like Alice Cooper, and I was like, dude. All right, Alex. Yes. All right. Now, Alex, say yoke. yoke. You're bigger than I thought. <laughs> so this is this been a little easier if you were more my size. Keep going, though. You can look just good someday. And, uh, now, a yoke, a yoke is a limitation. So let's yoke, all right? So when you're yoked, you're limited by the other person, right? So that if he and I are yoked together, everything I do affects him. Everything he does would affect me. Does this make sense? It's a limitation. If you've, if you've seen a yoke and a picture of two oxen yoked together, there's a limitation there. Let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. How many of you are aware of the fact that Christianity has limitation? There are things you can't do. Isn't that encouraging? Aren't you glad you came to youth conference to hear that? Christianity has limitations. Take my yoke upon you. That's an incredible invitation coming to me. It's an incredible way to address our frustrations. Bring your burdens and your cares. I, I, I'm on your side. You can bring them to me and I'll give you rest. But then he immediately jumps to the limitation. Take my yoke upon you. There's a limitation in Christianity. Thank you, bro. You can have a seat. Here's, here's what Jesus is wanting you to know. You're a child of God. How many of you are saved this morning? All right, then God called you to pursue purity rather than the perversion of this generation's pornography. How many of you are saved this morning? Then Jesus Christ called you to believe that sex is intended to be shared with one spouse in a physical, a physical, emotional, spiritual relationship over an entire lifetime. One person only, my spouse. That's God's plan. That's a limitation. The world says, oh, as long as you love each other, love is love. How many of y'all know that that is a dumb statement? First time I ever saw love is love was in a Super Bowl commercial. Love is love, the screen said. Showed two people behind a screen making out. Y'all, is that an okay phrase, making out? The teens still use that phrase as an acceptable phrase that's not too weird? In my generation, making out meant they were just like embracing, you know, like, like smooching it up. Is that what it still means? Am I, y'all with me? Tell me, does that still, is that what it means? So it's okay for me to say that? You're all not shocked that I'm saying that? So here was two people and they were, you know, making out. And uh, then they stepped out behind the screen. You could just kind of see the silhouette. Then they come out from behind the screen and it was two guys. Then you go back, here's two more people making out, doing the smooch it up thing. They come out on this side, and it was a guy and a girl. And then it goes back to the screen again, and they come out on this side, and it's two girls. And here's what this commercial was about. Love is love. I'm telling you, young people, that is a false way to look at sexuality. The highest expression of human love is not sex, and it never has been sex, and it never will be sex. The highest expression of human love is sacrifice. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The Bible says someday, guys, when you get married, that you are to love your wife as Christ loved the church. You know what that means? You're to sacrifice for her. You're to care for her. You're to lead her. You are to be the man she deserves as a daughter of God. When you get married someday, you marry a Christian girl. You're marrying God's daughter. You mess with God's daughter, he'll kill you. In love, of course. What does the world we live in say? Love is love. How many of you are Christians? All right, you've got a limitation. 
We believe sex is intended to be shared with one spouse in a physical, emotional, spiritual relationship over an entire lifetime. How many of you are Christians? All right, then we are called to believe that gender is determined by God and that science is right. That gender is part of our deoxyribonucleic acid, your DNA. Gender is not fluid. Science is right. Here's the weirdest thing about our generation. When I went to high school a few years ago, I was taught that I should be an evolutionist because of, here was their phrase, because of science. Evolution is better than creation because of science. Now anybody here that has studied the issue knows that evolution is not empirical science. It's not. You cannot, in a scientific laboratory, using the theories of real empirical science, you can't prove evolution, nobody ever has, and nobody ever will. So our evolutionist friends created a new branch of science called historical science. Since empirical science can't prove evolution, we came up with historical science that says historically this is the way it has to be. Since we know that we had to come from somewhere and obviously creation is not an option because there is no God, then they had to come up with a whole new branch of science called historical science because empirical science undermines the theory of evolution. And it always does because it is only a theory. It's not scientific. But I was taught, you should be an evolutionist because it's science. Now, your generation is taught, ignore science. Feelings trump science. Science says that you're born a guy or a girl, male or female. Your DNA determines whether you are designed feminine or masculine, male or female. And yet the world you live in rejects that. They reject science in favor of feelings. Can I ask you teens a question? How many of your teens are aware of the fact that feelings change? I'm going to ask you a question again. You answer this. How many of you teens are aware of the fact that feelings change? How many of you are aware of that? It's true, isn't it? Like, for instance, how, how, many, of you, how many of you have awakened, say, uh, what time do you get up to go to school? 6 a.m.? Let's use 6 a.m. The alarm goes off at 6 a.m. and you've got to go to first hour algebra. How do you feel about that? Here's how you feel about that. <clears throat> Life stinks. It's 20 below zero because of the curse of sin. It's dark outside. I got first hour algebra and I've got to go to school and the alarm just went off. Oh my word! We hate life. My feelings are pretty low at that hour of the morning. But teens are great. What's your favorite amusement park? Cedar Point? Y'all go to Cedar Point? Cedar Point's pretty awesome. Teens are so weird. It's algebra. 6 a.m. I got to go to algebra and we hate life. But we've got a day scheduled at Cedar Point and we got to leave at 4 a.m. to get there by opening time. 4 a.m., teens hit the floor. Yes! Woo! We're going to Cedar Point to stand in line with stupid people for hours. <laughs> Honestly, amusement, amusement parks are dumb. You pay $5,000 for lunch. I slightly exaggerate. You stand in, how long you stand in line at the average, at the average amusement park? It's just like, da 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 let's go down this way, let's turn around and go this way a while, and let's turn around and go this way a while, let's turn and go this way a while, let's turn and go this way a while, so we can turn and go this way a while, so we can turn and go this way a while, so we can get on a ride for 21 seconds. <laughs> and what do teens do? Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> Especially if it makes you throw up. It was so awesome. I just puked all over everybody. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how feelings come and go? Teenagers, one of the most dangerous things about our generation is we have taught your generation that science doesn't matter. Your feelings are more important than what is true. And Jesus is telling you something here. 
Christianity has a better way to live. Are there limitations in it? Does it mean that the culture and Christianity are at odds? Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we believe that gender is determined by God and that science is right, that gender is part of our DNA. We believe that the roles of men and women given in the Bible, determined by the Bible, are the best way to live. We believe that. Are we limited by that? Sure. We believe in treating others as we would want them to treat us. There's a limitation in that. There's, that means there's some things I can't do. We believe that life begins at conception. We will not support those who would believe it's okay to murder our babies. Are we limited? Sure. We realize there are things we cannot wear. There are some things we cannot watch. There are some things we may not be able to do. There would be some music that we will have to say, I can't listen to that. There will be some places I'll have to say, I can't go. There will be some shirts that I'll have to say, that's not pleasing to God. There might be an outfit that I'll have to say, that's immodest, that's too tight, that's too, too sexy, that's too slinky, that's too revealing. I can't wear that. I may have to say, you know what? There's some people I can't hang around and can't be friends with. There's a limitation in Christianity. Jesus is not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. He's telling you, I care about you. I want you to come to me, but I want you to know you come to me. I want your burdens. I want your concerns. I want your problems. I want your issues. I want you to come to me and bring it all, but I want you to know something when you come to me. you got to take my yoke upon you. There will be some limitations that you've got to embrace if you want my favor and my blessing, and I'll give it to you, but you've got to embrace the limitation. How many of y'all with me on that this morning? Am I making sense? All right, so here's an, 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 an invitation. Come unto me. Here is a frustration he's addressing. All ye that labor and are heavy laden. What a description of our generation laboring and heavy laden here's a limitation take my yoke upon you in other words jesus reminds all of us that there are limitations but don't you miss this jesus doesn't stop there jesus makes a startling declaration actually two of them first one is this learn of me Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Here's what Jesus wants you to know. Are you listening to me? Talk to me. Are you listening to me? Here's what Jesus wants you to know. He's gentle and kind and humble and good and easy to follow. I'm going to say that again. Here's what Jesus wants you to know, son. Ma'am, here's what Jesus wants you to know. He's gentle and kind and humble and good and easy to follow. Isaiah said it like this, if you want a glimpse of our Savior Jesus, surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I got to confess to you, I don't fully understand that. You pastors in the room, you preachers in the room, I confess you don't fully understand that makes sense to me that Jesus went to a cross and died for my sins. The New Testament describes it like this. God placed on him who knew no sin our sins. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That part makes sense to me. I marvel at it. I, 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 I I'm startled by it, but I, I understand that part. I don't know that I fully understand this part. Jesus said, hanging on that cross, I also carried your griefs. Dying on the cross, beaten severely, bleeding profusely, I carried your sorrows. What's the biggest sorrow of your life as a teenager? What's the biggest grief that you have? Jesus loves you so much. I, I don't understand this. I marvel at this. He loves me so much that he carried my griefs and my sorrows. 
Here's what he's wanting you to know, how good he is. Young men and young ladies, you don't have to be afraid of Jesus. In a world that ridicules Jesus, in a world that ridicules Christianity, for every ret and link that publicizes why they're rejecting what we believe, there are hundreds, thousands, millions down through history that got to know Jesus and found out that he's good. Found out that he's a better way to live. Take the world, but give me Jesus. Take the world's issues, give me Jesus. Take the world's decisions, give me Jesus. Take what the world's getting, give me Jesus. Learn of me. What a declaration. He's inviting you to get to know him. He says in one passage of the New Testament, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Two words, care and careth. Two different words. Cast all your burdens on Jesus. All of them. Bring your problems, bring your issues, bring your brokennesses, bring your sorrows, bring your secrets, bring your struggles, bring your concerns, bring your doubts, bring your failures. Bring it all. He cares about all those issues. The care on the other side, that's my cares, the burdens, the sorrows, the failures, the struggles, the loneliness, the issues, the brokenness, the pain, the hurts. Bring it all. That's your care. The care that describes Jesus is a different word. And all it means is simply this. You matter to him. Why is Jesus inviting you to come to him? Because you matter. Evolution in our world says, you know what? We're just a random collection of cells, and hopefully, hopefully, life will have a little bit of meaning here and there. But you die and you're done, so good luck. Jesus says, not so. You are created in my image. I'm on your side. Life has purpose. Life has meaning. And God wants to use your life and bless your life and do great things in your life. So come to me. Come to me. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come to me, he says. Come to me, and I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll show you that I'm good. I'll show you that I'm worth living for. I'll show you that this is a wonderful way to live. The first declaration is learn of me. The second declaration is in the last verse, and it is awesome. The second decoration basically just says this, and it is very simple. My yoke is easy. My yoke is easy, and my burden a lot is light. Now, Alex showed us that a yoke is a limitation. Let's come back up here, Alex. Do you know that a yoke is more than a limitation? You know what else it is? Do you know? It's a help, or more specifically, a strength. So if we're yoked, we're yoked, we're stronger. See, you couldn't take both of us. You could take him by himself. <laughs> Not the two of us together. You know what Jesus is saying? Hey, guys, girl, hey, 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 yoke up with me. Come on, yoke up with me and let me, let me do my work in your life. You know what you'll find out? My yoke is easy. You know what some of you think? Some of you have this idea, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, if I serve God, probably have to marry an ugly girl. Oh my goodness, if I serve God, I'll probably have to marry a bum of a guy. My wife didn't. Honestly, where do we get Identity is so boring and there's no answers and life's so frustrating. Find out if you'll come to me. Life is good. Come on, come on, come to me. You'll find out that my yoke is easy. You'll have to get rid of and stay off of and there'll be, there'll be some limitations. But I'll tell you what, you'll find my strength. You'll find my power. You'll find my favor. You'll find walk with you and he can bless you and he can be with you during the days when the curse... All kinds of problems, they're normal, dark. You can spend your life down... And you and he'll be near to you and he'll be there and he'll take care of you and he'll bring you through it for his glory and his honor and for Florida they'd be a good daddy I say well why would God do that to you why would God take your sons listen to me listen to me God doesn't do evil that's 
the curse of sin. If there's a God, why did my parents divorce? Jesus invites you to come to him because he loves you. You matter. There's an invitation. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke. And see what? Even there, I don't know why. Because God gave me peace. He when he was younger than you. And Sean and his sister hid in a bedroom house and took a shotgun and literally whose last memory of dad the story captivated my heart and, because the one thing that I want you to know about the pains of life Jesus is, bad, is already burdened and broken and struggling will you come to him my invitation this morning is simple. There are young men and young ladies in this room, and the fact is you don't know Jesus Christ and you've never been saved. Somebody's been talking to you about it, and you've been thinking about it, but you haven't yet come to Jesus. And I'm going to invite you today to confess that you're a sinner and to trust in Jesus Christ to be your Savior and to rescue you from sin and hell. Some of you here today, you, you know the Lord and you know that you do but I'm inviting you today to get out of your seat and make your way down to these steps and make an altar today in a new and fresh way to take Jesus yoke upon you to live for him and let him have charge of your life there are some of you in this room and things need to change things need to change and I'm inviting you son I'm inviting you ma'am to get out of your seat this morning and come here to these steps bring it to Jesus and make some changes come unto me as quietly as you can would you bow your head and close your eyes don't move just bow your head and close your eyes we're going to have a pianist come to the platform in a moment we want to have an invitation this morning for we in this session I want to begin with this. How many of you would say, Dave, I've never been saved, but I can see that Jesus is a wonderful God and a wonderful Savior, and today I'm ready to confess that I'm a sinner to ask him to be my Savior and my God. That's what I want. I'm ready. I will not embarrass you, but would you lift a hand that I can see it? It's what I want, and I'm ready. God's been talking to me, and I know he has. Dave, would you pray for me? I want Jesus Christ to be my God and my Savior. Would you lift your hand right now? I'm going to pray for you. Nobody's looking but me and a, a helper or two because of the sides of the building. Anybody that way at all across the room? I may miss you, but even if I miss you, God sees your heart and loves you and cares. Anybody at all? I'm going to look one more time just in case I miss somebody. Okay, there's a hand. Oh, yeah, thank God for you. Is there somebody else? I almost missed you there, but God loves you and saw you. And Right here, God bless you, friend. God sees you too, and he cares. Is there a third one that I've overlooked? I'm waiting. Both of you, you're so important to God. Jesus Christ died for you, and he was buried, and he was raised from the dead. If you'll believe on him, he'll save you. He'll give you eternal life praying for you. I'm going to invite you to be saved in a moment. Why don't you go ahead and pray right now? Just go ahead right now and pray in your heart. Say, oh God, I, I, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I confess I'm a sinner. I know that. Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. And then I want you to let us pray with you in a moment. How many of you in the building would say, Dave, I understand the invitation. I see the frustration, I understand the limitation, and I'm aware of the declaration. And this morning, as we start this youth conference, I want to dedicate myself in a new and fresh way. I want to take Jesus' yoke upon me. I want to live for him and let him have charge of my life in a definite and fresh way this morning. That's my desire. That's my heart. Pray with me as I do. Raise your hand good and high. How many of you would say, that's what I want? That's what I want, Jesus 
to take charge of my life, to yoke up with him. God bless you so much. And how many of you would say, Dave, I know there's things in my life that need to change, and I know exactly what they are, and I'm battling with them, and they're issues, and I'm going to give them to Jesus today because I need help with these issues. Pray for me about these issues. I need to give them to Jesus. I need help. Raise your hand good and high. Let me see it. Let me see it. God sees your heart. I want to see your hand. And God bless every one of you. I'll tell you what we're going to do. All of you that raised a hand, can I invite everybody in the room to stand? Everybody in the room, stand. Keep your eyes closed. All of you that raised a hand, would you, would you join me for prayer at the front? Would you just leave your seat and come and kneel? Just come on right now, just like that. You that are saying, you know, it's what I want. You that are saying there's an issue in my life. You that are saying I want to be saved. We want to pray with you. We want to love you. If you came with a church, you that want to be saved, if you came with a church, reach over to the pastor or the youth pastor or the youth pastor's wife or the pastor's wife, and just like that young man right there, and let somebody pray with you about it. And let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Give us a couple of stanzas there. Pray by yourself. Pray for each other. Pastors and youth pastors, if God wants you to come pray with one of your teens, come on. It would be entirely appropriate to even lay your hands on them and pray for them. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Young lady, I, I think I'm the only one that knows you. Raise your hand, but you're important to God. You know that, don't you? He so loves you. Would you let somebody pray with you about knowing for sure you're going to heaven? Would that, would that be okay? If it would, I, I can have someone meet you right there at your seat. Would that be okay? Could, could they do that? Or would you talk to me after the service ends? Would you be willing to do that? Because God loves you. He cares about you so much. If you don't know Christ and you believe on him, he'll save you. He cares for you. Pastor Howell's wife is here at the front. Would you like her to pray with you? If I had her go to the back there, would you meet her at the back? Would you do that? Would you just kind of stand at the back there, Mrs. Howell? If you'd let her pray with you, she's available right here. She's the lady coming down the aisle, just at the very back there, Mrs. Howell. If you just step out, she'll pray with you and love you and encourage you and help you to know you're going to heaven. God cares about every issue of your life. So if we can pray with you, she's available there. Every one of you that knelt for prayer, that raised your hand, would you be willing to lean over and pray with a friend about it? Let's just bow our heads across the room. Lean over and tell a friend what you prayed about and ask them to pray with you. Take a moment and pray together. The Bible says we're to bear one another's burdens. We're to fulfill the law of Christ by doing so. Would you just right now pray with somebody beside you? Just lean over and pray with somebody. Just take a moment, just a short prayer. Let people know you prayed about something and pray together. Father, in the almighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Father, and you know the hearts, and the needs, situations. Here are good young people this morning who live in this messed up, broken, frustrating world. I'm so thankful that you care about them, that you love them, that you are so able to meet every need of their life. Dear Father, for those who are needing to be saved this morning, oh, dear Jesus, speak to them. Draw them to yourself as you said you would do. Help them to believe today. And for all of us in this room who are 
bringing our issues to you, our burdens, our sorrows, our cares. Oh, dear God, minister to those needs. And for all of us who desire more than anything in the world just to give ourselves to you and to be used of you and blessed by you and protected by you and favored by you, have your way. We come to you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray these things. Amen. As you know, my name is Dave. I'll be around. If I can pray with you, encourage you, help you, that's why I'm here. All right, it's yours.